Okay, so we want to think about computational problem solving. We want to understand what does it mean to think computationally. That leads to the philosophical question, so what's computation? And like a good philosophical question, that leads to another deeper philosophical question. To answer that question of what's computation, let's start by asking the question, what is knowledge? And as we're going to see, we can divide knowledge up into two parts. There's declarative knowledge, which we can think of as statements of fact, and there's imperative knowledge, or how-to methods. Statements of fact give us truth, but as we'll see, they don't necessarily help us think about how to find new information. Imperative knowledge, how-to methods, or recipes, give us ways of finding new information, and that's going to be really valuable to us. Now, to look at this, let's look at an example. So, what do we mean by declarative knowledge? Well, here's a piece of declarative knowledge. That first statement says, the square root of a number x is a number y such that y times y equals x. You know that's true from high school algebra. It's a statement of truth. It tells us something about how to decide whether a particular number is a square root or not. But can we use this to actually find the square root? And the answer is no. If we have a number x equal to 25, and we're trying to find the square root of that, and somebody gives us a guess y equal 5, we can use this statement to test to see if 5 times 5 equals 25, which it does. But it doesn't tell us how to find the guess. So declarative knowledge, which is what much of knowledge is based on, isn't what we need. We want a different kind of knowledge. And for that, fortunately, we have imperative knowledge. As we said, imperative knowledge is how-to kinds of knowledge, or methods, or recipes for finding something. And here's a recipe for deducing the square root. It's actually attributed to Heron of Alexandria, although there's some debate as to whether he was the original creator of this algorithm, but it dates from the first century AD. And you can see the description here. The description says, if I want to find the square root of some number x, I'm going to start with a guess. I'll call it g. I'm going to take g and multiply it by itself and look if that result is close enough to x. If it is, I'm going to stop and say that g is the answer. Otherwise, I'm going to make a new guess by averaging g and x divided by g. And using this new guess, which I'll call g again, I'm going to repeat the process until we get something that's close enough. Notice this is a mechanical set of steps, and it has some basic forms. Right here, there's a test. It's going to let us know when we're done, when we're close enough. If that test isn't satisfied, then there's some simple calculations, like here. It tells us what to do. And then finally, there's a flow of control, or a loop, that tells us how to keep executing the same sequence of operations until we get, in fact, to a place where we're done. This is something that tells us how to find a square root. This is imperative knowledge, and this is what we want. Okay, let's try it out. Here's a little description of that. Let's see what happens if we were actually to do it. So I'm going to do a simple little simulation. I want to find the square root of 25. And yeah, I know the answer is 5. But let's think about what might happen here. I'm going to start with a guess. And I'm just going to initially guess 3. Heron of Alexandria's algorithm says multiply 3 by itself. That, of course, gives me 9. Is 9 close enough to 25? I don't think so. So let's get x divided by g, which is about 8.33. And now let's take the average of x over g and g. So we add g and x over g. Take the average of that, and we get 5.67. And then our little recipe says, take that and do it again. So this now becomes my new guess, 5.67. I multiply those together. I happen to know that comes out to be about 32 and a half. Gotten closer to 25, but it ain't there yet. So that's not close enough. Again, let's take x divided by this g, which turns out to be about 4.41. And then I take g and x over g, and I average them, and I get 5.04. And my algorithm says, my recipe says, take this and do it again. 5.04 multiplied by itself is about 25.4. And I'm going to say, you know what, that's close enough. So my little recipe says, there's the answer. Not perfect, but close enough. So, Heron had it right. This looks like a pretty good algorithm. This is a way of describing a method for doing something. And that idea 
that notion of a recipe is something we're going to use a lot. So we can think of algorithms as being recipes, sequences of mechanical steps for doing something. If we put that analogy to a little bit more use, we can see that recipes have much of the same form, real recipes. Imagine I want to make some custard. Here's my recipe. I'm going to take all the ingredients of the custard, that mixture, put it into a pot over some heat, and I'm going to stir it. As I stir it, every once in a while, I'll dip a spoon into the custard, pull it out, and run my finger across the back of the spoon. If the spoon is clear, then I'm done. And I'm going to remove the custard from the heat and let it cool. If not, I'm going to repeat. And notice what we have here. Again, we've got a test right there. And we've got a way of, in fact, changing the flow of control. So normally the flow runs this way. But based on that test, we have a way of going back up and continuing the path. And this pattern is something we're going to repeat a lot. So we want to capture recipes. And we need to figure out how to get the computer to do that for us, which is what we're going to talk about next.